Hello and welcome to the Movie Mouth Film and TV Podcast on this week's episode 16. Wow, bloody episode 16 already. Are you wondering what to spend your lockdown time watching over the next couple of weeks? Well, we have Netflix's new miniseries The Queen's Gambit, Disney Plus's Star Wars show The Mandalorian Season 2, and Forrest Whitaker starring in a new Christmas-themed Netflix musical, Jingle Jangle. Alongside these... <laughs> Listeners, if you're still with us, I cannot get through the intro to this week's podcast without laughing at Jingle Jangle for no apparent reason. I don't know why, but I'm going to keep going. Alongside these, we'll be discussing the latest film news and trailer breakdowns and a fitting tribute to a recently departed Scottish hero in a recurring video store corner section. This is your co-host, Miles, and this week I'm joined by not one, but two co-hosts. First is a man. He is scared of everything. He's scared of what he saw. He's scared of what he did, of who he is. Most of all, he's scared of walking out of this podcast and never feeling his whole life the way he feels when he's with me. Nobody puts baby in the corner. It's Phil. Hello. Hiya. All right. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, not. I'm not in the corner. But you are so... in lockdown. I am in lockdown, but I'm not in a corner, so everything's good. <laughs> good. Coming next, and in a first for the Starship USS Movie Mouth podcast, we are joined at the con by a third chair on the bridge, a young, <clears throat> blue-eyed ensign ready to steady the ship and interact with the recurring crew in order to secure a leading role aboard this very vessel. So much so that when a Movie Mouth away team is summoned to review exciting goings-on in a galaxy far, far away, he is the first off the shuttle, emblazoned in his freshly pressed red shirt. R.I.P. It's film critic and journalist, Sean Chrysanthu. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Hello there. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I heard that cough as well. <laughs> Well, it's been a while since we last had you on the pod, and you work for an independent cinema. How have you been finding the pandemic this year? How's the attendance been, and how are you navigating the lockdown? Yeah, strange times. Um, obviously, given the, the sort of second lockdown we're in at the moment, sadly, we've had to close down for another month. We were um, quite proudly sailing the ship of, uh, you know, of independent cinema, as all the uh, chains, Cineworld and that shut down. We were quite proud of the fact that we were the ones who were going to stay open throughout, but sadly Boris come down there. But you know we've been doing okay. Obviously reduced numbers, but our uh, our supporters have turned out and helped us, and uh, hopefully it will it will just be this month and and nothing more than that. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. We wish you all the best of luck with that um, over the next few months, and obviously. If you can, for those of you that are able to go out once the uh, lockdown rules change, do make sure that you, you visit your, your local independent cinemas to keep them in business. Um, so we'll start off with you, Sean. What have you been watching this week? Um, the, the, the latest thing I've caught up this week is probably uh, Star Trek Discovery, uh, which, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say is picked up uh, by the end of season two, I think. A lot of people will probably agree the show had pretty much disappeared up its own ass, but the big leap into the future, way beyond where anyone's gone before, is is welcome. I don't think they're killing it yet. The first episodes felt like they were bolder going where we've been before. Mm. There was a good episode with trills, you know, a race and concept I've always loved, but it still seemed rooted too far in the past. But I think the latest episode is 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 the best to date. It finally feels like we're in the future now. About to explore some some you know some new shit and um, yeah I, I I think it's going a good in in a good direction. I, you know, I kind of so wish it's safe just... to say that this season isn't Michael Burnham versus Tribbles. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair, yeah, fair point, fair point, yeah. Um, no, I, I think I think it's going it, it finally now. Sort of, I know we're not mid season, but approaching mid season, we're kind of going in a good direction. I just wish they'd stop yapping and being so bloody worthy. But other than that, yeah, I know it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm more psyched about Strange New Worlds next year, to be honest. But um, it's it's going okay. It's the right direction. Sounds good, Phil. I know you've had a ton to review this week, but what have you been watching? I have. I've I've been watching a few bits this week, but mostly stuff that's going to be featured on the show. But I did catch the 
uh, the first episode of season two of His Dark Materials. Oh, okay. Which is the series based on the um, Philip Pullman novels. And I really liked I, I really liked the first series of this. It was on BBC. Um, I thought it was really good. I think it got you know good reviews at the time as well. So pleased to see it make a comeback. And it was a strong first episode. So I look forward to seeing more of it. Yeah, and I think we should definitely review that. Maybe once we've got a two or three episodes in, it might be worth coming back to that one and definitely. getting your opinion. Um, definitely. And speaking of reviews, on the last week's show, we interviewed the director of the Nickelodeon uh, documentary, The Orange Years, a gentleman called Scott Barber. And he mentioned in that interview um, about a Ren and Stimpy documentary from the same uh, production company as, uh, as, as The Orange Years. So I went back, I watched a ton of Ren and Stimpy after we, we had the, the, the interview, and then I set my sights on Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy, the Ren and Stimpy story, which is the documentary... Um, aforementioned uh, earlier this basically follows the dysfunctional goings-on at the small animation studio that gets tasked with creating and running the Ren and Stimpy show um, as Nickelodeon in the early 90s decide to roll out their own original content Um, and it also starts to enlighten us more on the creator of the show who's later revealed to be an extremely toxic person involved in all kinds of bullying and harassment accusations and claims from from the team there so Really interesting um, to kind of see where this madcap, crazy characters came from, and the imagination it spawned from, and uh, you know some of the reasons in 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 this in this guy's kind of mentality as to as to why he then found this as an outlet. Um, but really interesting yeah. and happy, happy, joy, joy. If you can find that documentary, check it out for sure. Um, and then I've also been continuing on with with Fargo season four. Still great. I wouldn't say essential like seasons one to three so far, but we'll find out at the end of November once we get the final episodes of of this season whether it's whether it's up there with Noah Hawley's best uh, of of that show. Um, so let's jump into the listener question this week. We have a specifically non USA theme listener question in light of all of the news being dominated by the presidential elections in the US, uh, and this one comes in from Mark in Brooklyn, New York, who wants to know. Hi, Miles and Phil, and in this case, Sean. With the sad news of the passing of Jeopardy host and TV legend Alex Trebek this week, I'd love to know who are some of your favorite Canadian actors in Hollywood and why? Sean, would you like to get us kicked off? Yeah, I mean, following on from the Trek theme and, you know, Trekkie that I am. No, Trekker, not not Trekker, Trekkie. I was... Um, I should probably be going with Bill Shatner, but uh, or possibly even Nathan Fillion. But I think I'm I'm, I'm actually going to plump for Christopher Plummer. Um, he's one of those solid, always there guys. Um, a, you know, a standout actor, um, often often unappreciated. I think. It, I mean, if you guys are looking for a something of an obscure little Christmas treat as we're nearing the season, uh, I I'd recommend that. The movie from dates from 1978, uh, The Silent Partner, Plummer, Elliot Gould, Susanna York, and a very early performance by that other great Canadian, John Candy. Uh, Elliot Gould plays a bank teller who gets uh, early notice that his bank is going to be robbed and so squirrels away some of that money for himself. When the robber, Mr. Plummer, shows up and robs the place, Gould hands over some money, pockets the rest and blames the robber. But it turns out this isn't a robber you want to rob it's um it's a quirky little film uh and it features at least one human head in a fish tank you know <laughs> just kind of always a good thing. Uh, but it's a great showcase for for plumber himself and uh we're, we're seeking out what's it called it's called the silent partner oh i've not heard of that yeah i should definitely check that out phil okay um, other than other than your favorite lumberjack pancake breakfast <laughs> when you visit me in New York. What is oh, your favorite? What would you say is your favorite Canadian? I mean, Sean has just mentioned one of the top ones there, John Candy, absolute legend. Um, but there's there is a lot of really good Canadian actors. Uh, I think Michael J. Fox is one. Yep, second uh, that. Yeah, amazing. Uh, you know, obviously. Uh, classic uh, Dan Aykroyd, mm-hmm. who I'm going to have to mention, you know, being the Ghostbusters fans that we are, and 
And then I'm going to add to that Leslie Nielsen as well, because I've been yes. watching, I was watching Airplane recently, <laughs> and I've been watching a lot of Police Squad, and I absolutely love Leslie Nielsen. Surely can't you can't be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Don't call me Shirley. I just want to say, good luck, you two. <laughs> <laughs> We're all counting on you. We're all counting on you. <laughs> Nice. So, yeah. yeah, there's more. There's loads more, but yeah. you know, I could go on forever. I mean, for me, big one. No, no surprises. JC himself. No, not Jesus Christ. He wasn't born in Canada. <laughs> it's Jim Carrey, yeah. born in Newmarket, Canada. Obviously, now he's a naturalized American citizen. Um, but much of his upbringing was fed in from his relationship with his father growing up in Canada, um, and you know, grew up very, very poor as well. Uh, and actually, you know, helped out his family when he moved to Hollywood and his family moved with him. Um, so I just think an extraordinary talent, Jim, Jim Carrey, you know, otherworldly talent for me up there with Robin Williams, um, the American comedian. Um, but I think, you know, the fun thing was when researching this question is to say to you guys, who were you most surprised that they were Canadian? Was there any that kind of surprised you? I didn't know that Keanu Reeves was Canadian. And it, it was probably very common knowledge, but I didn't know. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and you know what? Interesting point to that. Both the leads in The Matrix are Canadian. Carrie Ann Moss is also Canadian. Carrie Ann Moss is, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's cool. I mean, well, for yeah. me, I mean, Leslie Nielsen, which I found out about 20 seconds ago. So, All oh, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is there any other surprises on my list? Frank Drebin yeah. should be a, should be actually a, a Mountie rather than a... <laughs> <laughs> U.S. detective. <laughs> I would have paid to have seen a film with Leslie was it, was Nelson it, as some sort of Mountie. Was it Robin Williams who said that being Canadian was a bit like living in the loft above a really great party going on in the house? But like, <laughs> <laughs> this is why we have hard. you on as guest host because you can offend whoever you like, and no one takes it out on Phil and I. <laughs> we don't assume any responsibility for our guests. I think, like the one thing I would say about Canadian actors is how funny most yeah, of them are. How many incredible you know comedians there are leslie nielsen being one of them yeah. jim carrey tom green mike myers ryan reynolds seth rogan obviously dan Aykroyd. you mentioned michael Sarah, the rick list moranis. Rick, moranis. rick moranis yeah, yeah. even even actually matthew perry from mm -hmm. friends who was actually born in massachusetts to a canadian mother but was raised and was brought up in ottawa ontario so okay. Matthew perry from chandler from friends yeah um you know, some really, uh, for me, growing up, I think some of the, the 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 kind of comedians that had a bigger biggest impact on my life were were Canadian. Um, yeah, with the exception of I would say Robin Williams. So, um, great question, and I loved researching it, loved looking into it, and finding out who actually was Canadian in real life. <laughs> in real life, not just in the, <laughs> in another life. <laughs> In another life when we're both cats. So yeah. let's jump into the news. And uh, speaking of a, of the passing of a legend, I think there's only one place to start. And, and that's with the sad passing of acting legend Sir Sean Connery, who um, unfortunately died just a day after we, we published our last podcast. So we didn't get a chance to, um, you know, write or have a significant homage to him. Um Considering that we have a hardened film journalist who was actually named after him, we thought it would be a fitting tribute for our special guest host, Sean, to talk about this one. Over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, just just listen to this list of names. King Arthur, King Richard, King Agamemnon, Draco, Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, Sir August de Winter, John Patrick Mason, Jim Malone, Danny Dravet, William Forrester, Professor Henry Jones, all those characters and many more. But let, let's be honest, the legacy of Thomas Sean Connery is built on one name. Bond. James Bond. My dad was a huge Bond fan and like so many 70s kids, as you said, I was named after 007 or at least the man who played him. I can't say it meant a great deal other than providing a useful shortcut when people asked to spell my name, but I'll admit to being more affected by Connery's death than expected. It's an odd, unsettling feeling when the man you're named after passes on. I never met him, I never even saw him in real life, 
but there's still a lifelong connection that sees me grieving the guy. Much is made of Connery's rags to riches story, and it's true. Growing up in an Edinburgh tenement of hard knocks, working from the age of nine to support his family, milkman, boxer, extra on Dixon of Doc Green, it's no real surprise then that Connery was hardly anyone's first choice for bringing 007 to the big screen. Even Bond creator Ian Fleming was resistant, until that is he saw his performance on screen. Connery brought weight, grit and charm to Fleming's blunt instrument. In fact, Fleming was so won over that he went on to pay Connery the ultimate compliment by officially granting Bond Scottish ancestry. James Bond unarguably made Connery a star, but after a decade Connery had had enough. He left the role twice, three times if we count Never Say Never Again. What followed was a decade of ups and downs, though it did serve up one of my personal favourites, The Man Who Would Be King, where Connery starred opposite his old mucker, Michael Caine. A movie that the legendary John Houston had been trying to make for years. It was originally intended for Clark Gable and Humphrey Bogart, then Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas were considered, and even Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Watch the final movie though, and it's impossible to imagine anyone else filling the roles of Danny and Peachy. It was Highlander in 86 that re-established Connery on screen. It was certainly influential in transitioning Connery's career from leading man to leading mentor, a transition which not only proved highly bankable, leading to a major revival in Connery's box office, but also gave Connery his only Oscar for The Untouchables. Though back then I can't have been the only one who got tired of Connery dying every time he appeared on screen. Connery was known for being forthright, blunt even, but a consummate professional and supportive of colleagues. Recent press reports of him going to bat for the then-fledgling director Michael Bay on The Rock are worth seeking out. In latter years, Connery made much of enjoying his retirement and his golf. Again, interestingly, he had no interest in prior to filming Goldfinger, needing Bond to, looking, to look good feel, swinging, swinging a club. The studio hired a young golf pro for two weeks to teach Connery how to cheat it on screen. It triggered a lifelong love of the game. And so there we are. The man who made James Bond real. The man who melted a million hearts. The man who gave people like me my name. And the man who gave us all the chance to do bloody awful Scottish actions. Will Sir Sean be remembered as the finest actor of his generation? No, he won't. But when it came to playing Sean Connery, nobody did it better. Thank you very much. Incredible words there. And uh, I think just to kind of round that off very quickly, but if you guys could just give me a couple of your favorite uh, uh, Sean Connery performances, Phil, over to you. Uh, I honestly think, I mean, putting aside all the Bond stuff, which is obviously, for me, he's definitely the best Bond there was, but putting that aside, it's got to be the rock for me just for oh, clear yes. like because he's such an asshole but like a straight to the point asshole i'm only film. boring your humvee <laughs> he's just and he's got so many good lines in that film uh i think you know we're i think all three of us are massive the rock fans yeah so i don't think there was any other one we could say really <laughs> i mean you know personally that's one of my favorites yeah, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm completely on board with that. I mean, I did. Hard, it's hard to imagine anything that's that's more that's more Sean Connery than The Rock. Um, yeah, yeah, right, for rock, me, so, same, rock solid. For me, the <laughs> same. I would agree with you. Um, also, I'd say uh, the Last Crusade, um, Indiana Jones. Yeah. I just think just the Pat yeah. Yeah. Um, and, I just and, think and, and, in that. yeah, and let's not dismiss. I mean. Prince of Thieves, you know, if anyone else was going to turn up to play, yeah, for, a for French the, for the king final bit. that was raised, exactly. and raised in France, <laughs> exactly, and uh, only exactly. spoke French, no, but spoke was French. inexplicably in England. Elfie, to, to give his, oh, yeah. yes, yeah. cousin, yeah. all right, of course, sure. of course, I am Jeff Luxley. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just going to spend the rest of this podcast doing Sean Connery impressions. <laughs> shall we, shall we? I would, but I can't do a Sean Connery impression. <laughs> okay, can you, do, can you do? Can you do? Can you say Carla was the prom queen when I did this one? 
Ready? <laughs> Your best. Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. Carver was the prom queen. Really? <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Sean. Uh, R.I.P. Man, and uh, yeah. thanks for all the movies. Indeed, and thanks for the name. So let's move on to some cheerier stuff. Phil, uh, in the news. Uh, yes. What have you got for us? Well, uh, <laughs> so speaking of a, a, another Canadian, uh, Seth Rogen is set to produce a film called Video Nasty, which is this uh, it's a horror, like a meta horror about a group of teens who rent a VHS and get sucked into a 1980s slasher movie. So I really like the sound. I'm in. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Sounds like right up my street. So I don't think there's any, um, there's no cast announced yet. Um, but uh, Jonathan Levine who collaborated with Rogan on Longshot and Fifty Fifty, and the night before is in talks to direct apparently. So yeah, I am well up for that. I like those kind of, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know, just yeah, meta sort of like cult films. I love them. Kind of sounds like Jumanji meets Scream. <laughs> or like Jumanji <laughs> yeah, meets Friday the 30th. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis is out there somewhere. She's listening. She's in the new Halloween. There's the new Halloween coming out, isn't there? The yeah. trailers have come out. Have you She's seen that? Got her agent out there. <laughs> yeah. Don't you worry about that. That sounds cool. So I'm quite excited. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah, me too. Actually, yeah, I didn't know that was coming. So definitely ex- excited by that. Good. I picked up on uh, some some COVID nineteen news around <laughs> movies being being pushed back um, due to significant spikes in in cases and country wide lockdowns that have been happening. Um, Warner Brothers are reportedly discussing internally whether to push back Wonder Woman 1984 to a summer 2021 release Mm. or to keep it for its original December 25th release date, but launch it exclusively on their streaming platform, HBO Max. Um, So big big issues with that um, in the HBO Max is is pretty much only available in the US. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it might be available on other vod platforms such as amazon prime throughout europe and so on obviously the impact it's going to have on on cinemas and you know the not just the the cinemas themselves but also the movie going experience um the fact that patty jenkins herself even stated that you know this was a movie that was really made for the big screen um and i think it looks fantastic from the trailer to be honest mm. um, yeah it looks like a really yeah, good great yeah. one that i was definitely looking forward to but I, you know i think this is showing that that Warner's are following in the footsteps of, of Disney Plus with with Hamilton and and, and Mulan, which launched uh, on the on their platform instead of in theaters. And interestingly, Disney announced uh, earlier this week that despite posting a seven hundred and ten million dollar loss in revenue so far this year, their stock prices increased dramatically uh, on Thursday after they announced seventy three million new Disney Plus subscribers during Q four this year. Whoa. So yeah. Warners are going to be trying to do the same with its HBO yeah. Max platform. And no doubt they've learned the hard way with Tenet's difficult box office struggles during yeah. the summer where audiences naturally didn't feel comfortable mm. going yeah. back. And, you know, even mass markets in, in America, like in, in New York and, and Los Angeles, movie theaters weren't open for people to see them. So, mm. you know, this is obviously going to have an impact here um on on pretty much everybody in in the film industry except the studios themselves yeah I mean, it's, it's 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 hard to take and you know the wonder woman news is is kind of depressing from a yeah coming from a cinema guy it's uh it, it's sad to hear um and uh, i don't know yeah that's uh, that, that's the first i'm hearing of that and that's kind of it really is kind of depressing Yep. Um, Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. But we'll keep you updated on that as things develop. Um, And, you know, hopefully there can be a a result for for everybody out there. Um, Sean, got some news for us. Yeah. I mean, I mean, on the face of it, I'd say the news of Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal, 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 uh, being attached to a new Michael Bay film wouldn't normally be the sort of thing that would catch my eye. But uh, Ambulance sounds like it might be an interesting project. 
There's a fair bit of industry buzz about it. The key thing here for me is that it's being touted as something of a return to Bay's 90s movies. Interesting that we should mention The Rock before. But, you know, back when, when Bayhem was a good thing, um, before those migraine-inducing Transformers movies. The script is said to revolve around two guys who flee a botched bank robbery in a stolen ambulance. That That's the rumour. Uh, the script comes from Chris Fedak, the guy behind TV's Prodigal Son with Michael Sheen, which, you know, is trashy, but it's kind of fun. So there's a glimmer of potential here for some decent popcorn fodder if, it, if, if it's a throwback to that period. I'm, I'm game. I'm up for it. Um, other than that, perhaps it's not big news, but I... David Fincher has basically confirmed that he's locked into Netflix for another four years. Again, not necessarily a bad thing, I guess. It will give him space and money to play for a while. Fincher himself has said that the deal is to provide, quote, content. But he even added himself that whatever that means. So it appears to be a fairly flexible arrangement. I don't know. In these uncertain times, I can't blame the guy. And I reckon there's a good chance of some good products coming out of this. Uh, Mank. Mm. His Citizen Kane themed movie with Gary Oldman, amongst others, I believe is out in some markets this week. I believe ahead right. of a Netflix release next month. I love Citizen Kane. So, you know, I'm looking forward to that one. I, I, I think there's potentially good stuff to come from that. It's exciting. I, I know it's going to be quite interesting to see the kind of where the drama is about, you know, how Mankiewicz had a, had basically a fight with Orson Welles over the writing credit of the, the script. Mm. Um, it could be interesting. I like, you know, films about Hollywood generally do pretty well as well. Oscars, mm -hmm. Ho Hollywood tends to love itself. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and give itself plaudits when it, when it shows itself in a, in a good light in some way. So uh, that could be interesting. I'm a huge David Fincher fan. He's, you know, my favorite, my favorite filmmaker for sure. Um, I know in the past he's had a lot of issues with budgets, uh, extending to, uh, Gone Girl as an example where, he didn't quite get the budget that he needed, uh, that he really wanted. And he was really fighting with the studios over that. I think before um, the, the eventual studio um, gave him, I think it was Fox that ended up giving him the, the unlimited budget that he needed for that. And then there was also another Gillian Flynn pro uh, project with Utopia that he was, he was actually going to make for uh, Amazon studios. Um, again, he, he wanted something like 40 or 50 million to, to create that. Um, and, because he didn't get the budget, he moved on. So, um, I, you know, I'm all for giving Fincher the money that he deserves because I think his films are incredible. Obviously, they need to have an audience. They're going to have an audience on Netflix. Um, I would like to see him go back to Mindhunter and continue that <laughs> after, you know, yeah. two brilliant seasons. Um, but it sounds like that's maybe not going to happen now due to, again, budget and and, and watch volume. But, but we shall see now he's locked in for four more years. So I think it's very, very positive news for me. Yeah. Mm. Great stuff. Great stuff. So trailers, gents. Um, did you catch any trailers? Phil, I think you sat down to watch a an incredible sounding trailer, didn't you? This week? Uh, it might be putting it. Uh, <laughs> you might be spinning that there, I think, a little bit. Yeah, this is the <laughs> this is the new and does it fill you with dread when I say the words, this is the new Bruce Willis? <laughs> yes, it does. Oh. yes, it does. <sighs> What it makes me think is it makes me think of being in Blockbuster Video <laughs> in 2007 and yeah. seeing a Bruce Willis, seeing about 10 Bruce Willis films that came out that year that I'd never heard of. Yeah, I think that's the problem with Bruce Willis now, isn't it? And um, it makes me sad. It makes me very sad. But this is the new Bruce Willis film, Breach. And uh, I'll give you a little synopsis. On the cusp of fatherhood, a junior mechanic aboard an interstellar arc to New Earth must outwit a malvolent cosmic terror intent on using the spaceship as a weapon. So, is but, Bruce Willis the cosmic terror? <laughs> he's not or the spaceship, ah. and, he's also, and he's also not the junior mechanic. <laughs> 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 Basically, it looks like from the trailer. It gives a lot away, and it looks like it's alien, but there's one alien. And it's and, Bruce Willis. No, and it turns 
other people into like weird zombie monsters. Okay. Uh, and the best line from the trailer. So this was just in the trailer. Uh, there's a bit where they're sort of like examining a body, and someone says something seems to be dissolving him from the inside out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, so this like Bruce Willis's career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like my yeah. stomach during the first <laughs> lockdown with all the alcohol I was drinking. <laughs> so yeah, this is um, Bruce Willis, Cody Kersley from Daybreak. You may see him in Daybreak, and uh, Rachel Nichols, who's been in quite a few bits, the, uh, the newer Star Trek stuff, uh, Continuum, and uh, GI Joe, and Amityville Horror, Horror, and all those. So it's out on the eighteenth of December. But watch the trailer, make your own mind up if you want to see it. Uh, I just thought it was worth mentioning. <laughs> it's yet to be seen. It's yet to be yeah. seen. Sean? But to, to just kind of comment on that. I mean, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, Bruce Willis's career? I mean, you know, go back to Pulp Fiction, and by the time, by the point Pulp Fiction had come out, he was, I think when Bruce Willis's name rolled in the opening credits, I remember reading that, you know, people were actually, actually in the in the opening audiences actually booed the fact that Bruce Willis was appearing and then by mm. the by the time he'd actually finished, he'd actually delivered his his performance within Pulp Fiction. They were cheering, and it's kind of incredible, isn't it, that we're kind of back to the point now where Bruce Willis films are kind of like, oh yeah, whatever. But yeah, yeah, sad. Hudson Hawk himself, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. But yeah, trailers. Um, well, fortunately, you know, I yeah, there's a great trailer out this week for the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special. Um, I mean, some of you might recall the uh, the original original holiday special from Star Wars, which you know I'm sure is out there on YouTube and things to discover. I think George Lucas has yeah. pretty much disowned himself. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it it is truly, truly eye bleedingly awful. Um, actually, ear bleedingly awful as well, given Carrie Fisher's singing. But the, you know, this is um, you know Lego. Yeah, it's always it's always good for a giggle, isn't it? Lego and Star Wars, and this this seems to be a blend of Lego and robot chicken. But I mean, to be fair, it, it looks glorious. Um, it premieres apparently on I think on seventeenth of November. So you know, there's there's not long to wait. It's pretty All we're right. pretty much there. Um, I'm personally, I'm going to try and hold on until Christmas Day. Will I manage it? Probably not. I'm probably going to go for it. Um, Looks good, goofy, silly, yeah. Why not? Yeah, I'm up for that. Me too. Definitely. Star Wars and Lego sold. Winner. Sign me up. Take my money. <laughs> Reminds me of the time I built my uh, Lego Jabba's sail barge with <laughs> with Tatooine skiff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Lego Sarlacc pit as well. The Lego Sarlacc pit. And how 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 cool was Luke's salute? I mean, that was that, that two finger. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> there you go. So, in reviews this week, we have some really interesting stuff, actually. But I'll get us started off. Uh, I sat down to watch The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, based on the book by Walter Tevis. This is Scott Frank's uh, new um, Netflix miniseries. Um, and follows the unsuspecting career of Anya Taylor-Joy's Beth Harmon as we see her rise through the ranks of competitive chess. So as dull as that sounds, (laughs) this is a boozy and undignified look at the game of chess. And at its heart, it's more about the balance of obsession and addiction um, with social awkwardness and trust over the span of a young prodigy's early years. Anya Taylor-Joy is a marvel in her role as Beth, having first really laid a punch with Robert Eggers' seminal 2015 goat-based horror, The Witch. She is surely nailed on to become the next big thing in movies. Likewise, also Scott Frank, who over his career has brought us a ton of really interesting projects, predominantly as writer. Here, he's excelling again as director, as he did for Netflix's other miniseries, Godless, uh, which was the Western set uh, series. He that he brought um, with uh, Jeff Daniels here with many of that show's ensemble returning to slash out the supporting characters predominantly here of course his career extended as a writer he he wrote a lot of uh, gems really such as Logan 
the Wolverine, uh, last Wolverine movie. Minority Report, he wrote the screenplay for and also adapted Get Shorty. Um, but his stature and talent as a director is really growing considerably due to his many dabbles, perhaps with director James Mangold on various projects. Here we get visually stunning moments such as a chess game being played out in the shadows of a child's dormitory ceiling, a tracking shot through a 1960s Las Vegas hotel, and the kind of performances only A-list actors can pull off regardless of the level of direction they receive. This also has a strong visual kick, feeling thematically of its time and on par, I would say, uh, with Mad Men, another show set amongst the pastel and Pan Am shaded era of the 60s. In the hands of Ryan Murphy, this would have been an all-modern bombast and Tim Burton-esque uh, palettes and, and colours. But here we're, we are in the period, and the attention to detail for me was was excellent. Being 60s-based, however, doesn't bog this down into cliche. For example, in a drugstore, very quickly, uh, as Beth is perusing for something to read, our eyes are led away from a newspaper article talking about JFK, and the camera rests on a chess magazine cover. Um, so it's here that we see this this show really has a way of uh, navigating this this period without focusing or creating a pastiche. Um, and Beth here, we barely leave her. Um, she navigates the uh, man's world when it comes to both the 60s, America, and the chess world. Um, and she adds a large volume of pathos, uh, psychopathy, almost of a serial killer, slowly tormenting her challenges both in chess and in relationships until she's victorious with her own selfish uh, quest. For me, this is not only one of the sh the best shows I've had the pleasure of watching on Netflix, but possibly one of the greatest miniseries ever. <clears throat> I would say it's up there with the likes of HBO's Watchmen as an, es as an essential watch. And as the star-making turn for Anya Taylor-Joy, it's not to be missed. So highly recommended. I would even slap a masterpiece tag on this. Gents, I don't know if you feel the same. Yeah. I mean, I've watched, <clears throat> I think I'm at about, because it's, was it seven episodes first, the, the, the season? I think seven. Yeah. I seven. think I'm about four seven. in and it is phenomenal. Love it at the moment. Really, really, really enjoying it. I didn't think I would at all. When we were talking about stuff to review and you said, oh, I'm going to, watch that show about that woman playing chess. I was like, well, oh, go for it, <laughs> whatever. I got stuck with Jingle Jangle, the Christmas yeah. film, and you got the, <laughs> you got the Netflix masterpiece, didn't you? What a fool I am. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll find out later in the yeah. show whether Jingle Jangle is a masterpiece. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it, it really showcases – it showcases Taylor Joy, doesn't it? I mean, the fact mm. that she basically carries this whole whole mm -hmm. series through. I mean, it, it it is superb. I mean, I, I found myself. I mean, I've, I've seen the whole thing. Um, I found myself absolutely kind of almost slack jawed at, at the level of uh, yeah, the production values of this. You know, yeah. just you know, in individual hotels that she walks into, just the level at which that sort of late sixties world is built is just yeah. incredible. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I must say, you know, I was impressed by it's, you know, okay, so you've got someone growing up in, you know, you've got an orphan growing up in a care home, you're expecting it to go into these god awful explorations of, you know, abuse and this, that, and the other. And, um, you know, it does deal with certainly abuse at a pharmaceutical level. Mm. Um, but for me, I was, I was impressed to how just generally it, it's sort of steered clear of certain cliches that you might expect expect to pop up um and you know to to come out as rounded storytelling um uh yeah i mean it's it's you know it it, it ticks boxes in certain areas yeah. but but certainly as a i mean uh my wife and i did this over actually we did it over two nights we were that gripped uh which i think is is fair commentary of of a series that which like you said it's about a woman who plays chess mm -hmm. um but yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, a high, uh, yeah, a high recommend from me. Yeah, same for me. I did, I did this in two nights as well. Um, so The Queen's Gambit, available now on Netflix, wherever you are. Sean, speaking of you, sir, Mando, season two. 
Mando, Mandalorian himself, yeah. Um, I mean, before we dig into Mando too much, I think it's probably worth saying that I I haven't actually hated what Disney have done with Star Wars overall. Um, I'm not too impressed what they've done to the cinema industry of late, but um, with Star <laughs> Wars, um, the last trilogy, I mean, it grew into a bigger and bigger missed opportunity, let's be honest, and Rise of School Skywalker was an exercise in box ticking for me. Probably the very definition of meh, but but you know, Rogue One was solid. I have a soft spot for a you know a lot of what happened in Solo, but the Mandalorian, oh, it's great, isn't it? I mean, yeah, Mandalorian it, hits yeah, every box for me. Yeah, I mean this Star this. Wars yeah, I mean it. it it's fan. It's, it's fanboys producing for the fanboys. Is this the it? way? Yeah, it, it is, is. It is absolutely entirely the way. way. Yeah, I mean it's it's fanboys making Star Wars, but never, never losing sight of the fact that they need to actually produce a genuine quality product. Um, I mean, I I actually enjoyed the mix of tones in the first season, and I think the second season, especially the opening episode, has been it's been pretty much great. Really, I mean, it's breaking new ground, breaking new ground while piling on dollops of nostalgia. It, it ain't easy, but that opening episode was great i mean yeah i i can't say i loved how many times the movie series felt the need to go to tatooine i mean there's how many planets but i was fine with it here yeah i mean a crate dragon in action gamorian guards wrestling i I love it there's there's an expanded universe novel i don't know if you guys have come across it by john jackson miller it's it's called kenobi it's about the adventures of obi-wan in the desert during that period and Oh no! He, he gave it a real, a real sort of space western frontier vibe, which they've clearly embraced here in 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 episode one, and it bodes well for me for the Kenobi series next year. I mean, <laughs> and I mean, throwing in today's go-to cowboy Timothy Elephant, Ole- uh, Oliphant. Kevin, not say elephant. <laughs> Oliphant was 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 a fun move as well. Um, yeah. You know, episode one, great ending. Episode two, it's taken some flack for going a bit Harry Potter, but apparently those snow spiders do actually date back to Ralph McQuarrie concept art for Empire Strikes Back. So you know, right. you know, Star Wars got there first. Hey, you know, there's there's some good, there's some lovely sort of dark character development for Baby Yoda. Nice little cameo from the current Star Wars Supremo Dave Filoni as Trapper Wolf. Um, I find it interesting that they refer to individual episodes as chapters. Yeah. Given that it's so episodic in production, but that's fine. Um, I mean, they yeah. do the same in Star Wars, no? In the movie series. Yeah. It's, it's... Actually, they say episode for the movies. They say chapters for the films. <laughs> yeah, and I find that odd, given that the the, the series is so episodic. But uh, but you know, for me, yeah, it, the Mandalorian's quest is is kind of being followed through with with wit, action. Um, it's a win for me, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Second, second that as well, Phil. You probably third that. Yeah. Um, I, I do feel in some places I feel like it's it's very much fan film, like you say, Sean. Yeah, and there is that feeling that it doesn't necessarily. I think it's more to do with how it's filmed, more with the mm. kind of some of the steady cams and things that they use, and the yeah. jostling around and the follow. It's not as filmic as uh, as the Star Wars movies for me. Maybe the other than the John Favreau uh, first episode mm. of season two, um, but it does it does for me still have that kind of that fan made element to it, which is isn't really a bad thing is it because you know i guess the creator themselves the creator himself made the episode one two and three and you know that was too far from what the fans wanted you know episode uh six seven uh seven eight and nine you know maybe veered too far back to the original three this is kind of forging new ground somewhere and interested to see where it continues and probably more interested to see what happens with the kenobi series as and when mm. it goes into production mm-hmm. and we finally get that mm-hmm. so phil you've kind of spoiled it already <laughs> but uh you were tasked with the enviable review this week of netflix's jingle jangle 
Jingle jangle. Tell us more. <laughs> so, yes. Or shouldn't you be singing this review? No, because I can't sing. At least dance it. <laughs> so, yeah, this is this is Christmas. It's finally here. Uh, although I think when I woke up at, at half past eight this morning and went downstairs to put this on my TV at half eight on a November morning, I wasn't feeling very Christmassy, <laughs> to be fair. Um, I, apart from seeing like a snippet of the trailer, I hadn't seen anything about this. So this is the new, very new, released today, uh, Friday the Friday the 13th of November, uh, Netflix musical Christmas film. So it's set in a Victorian uh, steampunky fantasy land. Um, and it tells the story of Jeronicus Jangle. Uh, played. Oh <laughs> <my> <laughs> Ironically, it's, it's I'm the sorry, name I've you cracked. give to your uh, reproductive organs. Isn't it? it is, isn't it? That, the old, get, get, get down, Jeronicus. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stop jangling, yeah. Jeronicus. <laughs> <laughs> it. This, Oh, God. I'm not going to get through this, am I? So it tells the story of Jeronicus Jangle, uh, played uh, at a young age by Justin Cornwell and later by Forrest Whitaker. Um, so he is a masterful inventor who has, uh, you know, he's got everything. He's got a family. He's got a lovely family. He's got a successful toy shop uh, filled with his fantastical inventions. Um uh, you know, he's really well respected within the community and they all love him. Um, but then he is betrayed by his apprentice, Gustafsson, uh, who <laughs> is played in younger years by Miles Barrow, but an older age by the probably slightly more familiar um, Keegan Michael Key. Um, and he steals. Uh, Jeronicus' book of inventions and his brilliant new invention, which is an animatronic bullfighter figure named Don Juan Diego, who is voiced by Ricky Martin. Uh, and um, so the adventure really begins when Jangle's granddaughter comes to stay with him and she tries to turn her now depressed and downhearted grandfather around because it's been 30 years since uh, his inventions were stolen. And she tries to convince him to believe in the inventions that he used to be so good at creating because he's basically got all depressed. He's turned into like a pawnbroker and only, you know, he doesn't do any more inventing, doesn't make any new toys. Um, now, it's... <sighs> When this started, I was like, oh, my God, this is it. This is, you know, the most it, it, it's very it's very cliche, but it's very well made. I'm going to say, you know, it's really corny, but it suits the the stage musical type performance that it gives. And without a doubt, the performances in this are really good from pretty much the entire cast. Uh I love Forrest Whitaker anyway, uh, in you know, in pretty much everything he does, and he absolutely shines in this. He does a, a great job singing as well. Um on the singing front, there are some big musical numbers in this, lots of lavish choreography and dancing, and it, it feels at some points like you're watching like you've bought the video of the the stage show. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. you, it's, you, you're watching the DVD of, of this on Broadway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's that's what it is. It's a, it's a musical. It's a Christmas-based musical. Um, <laughs> so it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, the this, music... This, yeah, sorry. <laughs> this is feeling like a film I might very much love at about 2, 2 p.m. on Christmas Day. Is that right? <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Are you yeah, drunk the, by then, Sean? Or are you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the, the music in it, though, it's really catchy. It's a lot different to the, what you would expect in a film, especially set in this sort of Victorian. I know it's fantasy, but it's sort of <laughs> Victorian steampunk type era. Uh, but it's got because it's got a more, much more soulful and urban sort of vibe to the music. Um, 
the sets are spectacular. They look amazing, like properly sort of theater, theater spec, like, you know, really good sets. Um, CGI is top notch. And I think one thing that really stood out to me while watching it was that the, as I said, it's a steampunk Victorian sort of set thing and the costume design in it is amazing it's full of color but really everyone there's so many different costumes and stuff in this on the like when there's huge ensembles everyone dancing everything and it looks it looks amazing it's really eye-catching um it's also it's got to be said it's also refreshing to see a cast with such diversity in it with you know black actors in all the major roles and that's you know hugely down to the director as well who's uh, renowned for making films like that but it, it's it was really good and i think maybe the only criticism i had for it and you'd be surprised to know this is only one of them <laughs> is that it's a little bit long it's over two hours just mm-hmm. a bit over two hours mm-hmm. and it did feel like it dragged quite a lot right. it took quite a while to get from like the the transition of the early uh you know the early days to the latter days um but if you like the sound of a film that feels like a cross between Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Titty Titty Bang Bang with the pinch of Mary Poppins and the greatest showman thrown in, then bloody well jingle jangle yourself over to Netflix and give it a watch. I'm in. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah. Do it. Sold. I'm yeah. in. I'm in. Yeah. I'm up for it. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yes, yes, I yes. think you should. You should definitely watch it. I, I'm going to watch it, but I probably won't watch it in November, November like you did, Phil. Which I'd just, watch it in December. Weird, uh, yeah. December it in will November. help it. Yeah. Uh, and maybe not at like half eight in the morning. Watch yeah. it, you know, get, get cozy. <laughs> get a, you know, get a whiskey on the go. It's the kind of film, I was talking to my brother about it after. It's the kind of film that if you're a kid, you're going to love it. You're yeah. going to absolutely love it. Visually, it's amazing. There's cute characters. There's, you know, good songs, everything like that. Um, but it's completely watchable and enjoyable. Um, it's brilliant. Yeah, go and watch it. Phil, right. you, jingle you, jangle. You made an interesting point there where you said about it being over long, and I, I, I do wonder: is this an issue with with kind of you know the whole streaming concept? Netflix, Amazon. Should we should should there be someone coming in cutting this stuff back i i yeah it, it, I don't it's know. kind of a fear a fear i have of this stuff of the cuz they're not required to edit to a an a, you know a required runtime that maybe yeah. stuff is running on too long i felt like cuz i got into and it wasn't because it was awful or anything like that mm. it was just because i got i got into like i think it's about 30 nearly 40 minutes into it and i just pressed i to um, I went to go and get a coffee because it was the morning. <laughs> so, you had to go and make your uh, breakfast. Which is yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I paused it and then realized there was still like quite a long, like way longer to go than I thought there was going to be. Yeah. Mm. And I thought, yeah, this is definitely dragging. Like it's, it's not, you know, what can they possibly do in this to keep me entertained for the next <laughs> hour and a half or whatever? Mm. Oh, so, a, lot, a lot's been said, a lot's been said on that point, Sean, obviously about Netflix you know, not acting like the studios would, which is, you know, giving almost final cut, final edit to their mm-hmm. filmmakers. Um, I think there's, it's a poison chalice, isn't it? It's a good thing and a bad thing. More of more of your favorite filmmakers' content, um, yeah. but then also, you know, giving them free reign and not reining it in to the point where you've got punchy, um, watchable movies. And and certainly, you know, Phil and I, we week in week out and and you know you'll be the same watching and reviewing things each week it, if we get something that's an hour and 30 hour and 40 minutes long to watch it's almost like oh thank god this one's only an hour and a half yeah you know this one's 130, 130 minutes 100 you know anything over kind of 120 minutes i would say usually becomes a bit of a killer doesn't it yeah it can do yeah i think i, th- I think there's that sense but- but I think there's also that sense of the fact, you know, just because you see the director's cut written underneath the title on a release, um, you doesn't mean it's or, better. Exactly, yeah. You mm. automatically assume, oh, this is the definitive article. But actually, unless, maybe... unless you're talking about James Cameron's Aliens, in which case, <laughs> that's yeah, absolutely it's one hundred percent, and it's over two hours. But who cares? Fair they play, have yeah. they have <laughs> auto turrets. Same with Terminator Two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I. I, I it worries me a little mm. about you know the the whole streaming experience that the fact that 
maybe people aren't required to cut things, make make things as tight as perhaps they should be. Um, but, yeah. Well, you know, I think on that point, um, it doesn't really matter because right now, gents, we're getting the time machine and it's time for some VHS. It's time for this. <laughs> Well, Sean, welcome to Video Store Corner. As this week's red shirt, you have officially survived this away mission so far. However, we are into new uncharted territory here. Um, you had a literally endless selection of movie masterpieces to choose from here in our hallowed video store from oscar winners to important messages for our continual survival and cohesion as a self-aware species improving and enriching our experiences on this planet feel free to tell our listeners what important and deeply crucial movie you've selected for us to watch this week well i'm glad you didn't pile more pressure on me there miles um that's the only red shirt to ever 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 been back to the Enterprise assembled, or at least in assembled in a form it was supposed to be. So, where do I go? So, Sean has, has passed, and um, I think, yeah, we've got to be looking at a, a Sean Connery movie. For me, Bond aside, as Sean Connery movies go, we've got to travel back to 1986 with a director, an Australian director, Russell Mulcahy. Um, a movie that has been has had sequels, even a, a TV series has come from this. Yeah. Um, but ultimately... There can be only one. Highlander, 1986, Russell Mulcahy. Well, so... You've seen this a dozen times, Sean, maybe more, I'm guessing. Um, over the last 30 years, probably more than that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Phil, how many times have you seen this before today? Well, uh, I realised watching it again last night that I I think I'd only ever seen the end of this film. <laughs> Weirdly. <laughs> Which, let's face it, would confuse you considerably. <laughs> a lot, a lot, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's one okay. that I've been meaning to, you know, get round to, uh, and I, I, I think I, I think what it is, I think I thought I'd seen it, but then watching it yesterday, I was like, I have no recollection of any of this, but the last twenty minutes, so yeah. I must have just watched it when it was on TV at some point. I, I had, over. I had never seen this. I'd right. never seen anything. I'd seen that in the in the late eighties, early nineties, there was a Highlander TV series, a cartoon series for mm. kids. Um, which I saw and uh, following some kind of, some kind of McLeod in the future, I think it was in the distant future. Right. Um, but I, uh, I'd never, I'd never seen this. I, I'd always wanted to, I just never got around to it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, for, for those of you that haven't seen it, um, this, this, the, the, the plot for this is basically Connor McLeod um, played by Christopher Lambert, born in the Highlands of Scotland in the year 1518 turns out he's immortal um so he finds out because he gets wounded in battle that he doesn't die and uh he's banished from his village for for being the devil's kin because he basically comes back to life from a mortal this this mortal wound he meets another like himself um the aforementioned ramirez uh played by the late great Sean Connery, who teaches him swordmanship and that the only way to kill another immortal like himself is to cut his head off. And then also teaches him the ways of the immortal. Flash forward to the 1980s. Bang. Now we're in New York City and we're away from the baying crowds of this kind of medieval period. Um, and, uh, and then we basically, I mean, I can actually, I'll actually, I'll actually segue into the, the kind of plot 
and where this thing kicks off. Really interesting, this this film. I don't know if you agree, but it does just kind of drop you in the middle of it without you really yeah. knowing what the fuck Absolutely. is going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. straight in. Straight Doesn't in. It? Like, what the hell? We, we, we basically see Chris Lambert, for no apparent reason, in, a, in, in Madison Square Garden in New York City. This is literally the start of the film. It's a professional wrestling fight. Um, he is surrounded by leering men um, while he's wearing a really pervy looking flasher Mac. <laughs> yeah. I knew you were going to go there. I knew it. Which, yeah. which has, let's face it, significantly strong undertones of Kyle Reese. 100% from yeah. Terminator. He's got the trainers on as well. He's got the trainers. It's basically the outfit from when he gets yeah, out of stealing absolutely. the clothes. 100%. Yeah. Um, without the sweatpants. Yeah. He he then runs down into the underground parking lot underneath the stadium and inexplicably, and this is genuinely how this film starts, he's watching a wrestling fight, runs out into the underground parking lot and inexplicably starts a sword fight with an elderly gentleman who then does a shit ton of gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you forgot to mention that the way that that elderly gentleman is introduced, he literally just jumps like he's just like appears behind him in the most comical way, and he's like McLeod. It's like the best thing ever. I laughed out loud when he just introduced like just popped onto the screen. I don't know what was going on. He he then decapitates the old man, yeah, and then levitates in the air, <laughs> doing a Jesus on the cross pose before <laughs> describing what can only be explained as a thunderous orgasm, mm. which makes all of the car windows around him explode <laughs> as he reaches climax. Mm. And he oh, is really going for it. God. And what, what, what makes it even more visceral is that this film has been completely, all of the ADR, all of the dubbing, they've gone back and all of the actors have gone into the studio and they've added the dialogue because they, weren't, they, they didn't have these on-set mics to differentiate the sound between sound effects and everything else. So, it's, so when he's orgasming, it's like, oh! It's so oh, loud. Oh, I had to sit down because like, my neighbours are going to think I'm watching some significantly uh, hardcore male-on-male porn. Yeah, look, okay. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch in here as, as the oldest guy in the room. You know, it... it... <laughs> It's hard for me to be subjective about this, to be honest, because th- this movie was such a big part of my growing up. In you know, I've stuck with it. I've watched it every kind of year or so. So it's it's not like a lot of other movies that you rewatch, say, twenty years later and go, "Wow, that bit sucked." This has kind of always been current with me, but at the same time, I'm I'm listening to two guys who've seen it either now or relatively recently and i'm shaking my head going oh crap they're so right <laughs> <laughs> we are I mean, fresh on the highlander boat I mean, so <laughs> wrong. Yeah. i'm not i'm well don't talk about boats i don't like boats and i don't like water and i'm not a fish <laughs> um so uh, we're not critiquing it here this is just no, no, the way not. that you're dragged into this world i can i can i can the only way i can explain it is it's like when you have the flu and you go to sleep and you start having really weird dreams and you wake up and then you go out to sleep again. It cuts forward from him having this this oh. thunderous orgasm underneath Madison Square Garden um, to then literally an immediate cut. The next thing we see is he's riding around on a horse in the year 1536 and screaming, McLeod, at everyone. <laughs> There's no explanation. Of course he is, Miles. Why, why do you think this is odd? Well, we there is it's just a zero explanation. It's just so here we have a movie now set in Scotland, um, with a you know we'll, we'll get to it, but with a supporting turn from the most Scottish man of all time in Sean Connery, and who is he playing? He's playing an Egyptian from Spain, <laughs> Juan Lopez Villalobos yeah, Ramirez. Absolutely. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's dressed oh, like God, we're, surf- po- we're poking he, holes in Highlander. Jesus, he's, he's, he's dressed like when Sean Connery turns up. He's dressed like Sir Francis Drake. Yes. <laughs> he's, got, he, he's, he's got an earring and everything. He's like Errol yep, Flynn yeah, on yeah. fucking steroids. Right. Well, uh, look, I, I was going to put this into the. <laughs> we, I know we're going to talk about lines later on, but I'm going to put this straight in because it relates to this perfectly. 
And it's when we see Ramirez pretty much introduced and Connor McLeod uh, says, you look like a woman, you stupid <laughs> haggis, which is the insult that he gives him. Uh, and Ramirez, the most <laughs> Scottish voice person in the world, because it's Sean Connery, says, haggis? What is haggis? What's haggis? <laughs> what is haggis? haggis? And then he says... What's haggis? He says it's a, and a, you know I'm sure we'll mention accents later on. He says it's sheep stomach stuffed with meat and barley. And Ramirez says, and what do you do with it? Are you eat and it? he says, you eat it. How revolting, <laughs> right? So I watched that. I, you know that scene was brilliant. I rewatched that scene again on YouTube today just because I found it <laughs> hilarious. And number one comment on that video made me laugh out loud. That is the description of that scene wherein an American Frenchman playing a Scotsman explains to a Scotsman playing an Egyptian Spaniard what haggis is, and it's believable. (laughs) Which I I think is the key to appreciating Highlander. (laughs) (laughs) That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Haggis is the key. So (laughs) haggis aside... Basically, it, it jumps forward into this time in Scotland. We then see Conor McLeod getting trained by Juan Lopez Villalobos Ramirez as he trains him in the ways of the uh, the immortals and uh, teaches him about the quickening, something I still don't understand. Um, no. We'll get uh, to that. All right. And, you know, it kind of um, it kind of brings us up to modern day, basically. He kind of lives out his years um, in Scotland um never aging all of you know his wife who he's with at the time you know gets old and dies and quite somber um uh and then kind of flashes back into the 80s where he's now basically being circled because uh this decapitated corpse is found underneath uh madison square garden and through some mystifying dna um (laughs) <laughs> research he's sword he's traced DNA. is it, is sword it is DNA. This thing where where a sword left metal fragments on a neck yeah well brilliant. a yeah. sword left metal fragments yeah. on a neck underneath the body and the only <laughs> you know explicable reason that this could be linked to conor mcleod is because he owns a an antique store yeah. in soho <laughs> <laughs> is that's our man that's that's our man Bingo. there he is yeah um and and then the kind of it's interesting because from that point on, the, the 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 kind of suspicion of him as the the perpetrator is kind of dropped, really. <laughs> in, in fact, almost completely. <laughs> and he's then left to just roam around the city at his yeah. own free will. <laughs> he's like, like am I actually under arrest? They're like, yeah, yeah. no. He's like, all right, see you later. <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> see ya. Um, and then he gets kind of involved in a, a kind of romance with one of the one of the the DNA experts that's that's uh, that's kind of looking into the case. He he's also being followed by um <laughs> by the Kurgan, um who is the his nemesis from uh, from the the uh, the period in which he was stabbed and you know discovered he was he was immortal, uh, who's now here in modern day New York as well as well. He was who was he played by Phil? He was played by um Clancy Brown. Ah oh, who... amazing. Yeah, which you'll will you'll the warden. It, yeah, the warden. Yeah, it's from Shawshank Redemption, yeah, and also uh, Sergeant Zim in Starship Troopers. Yes, Love now that you're film. talking. Uh, brilliant. He, he's great in this as well, isn't he? He's brilliant. He's annoying. He's annoying as fuck. Like, but <laughs> but it's like warranted. He plays the character well. Yeah. So he he's basically he basically shows up in in modern day eighties New York to to kill. For no apparent reason, um, the other immortals that are still alive, including obviously Connor, um, I still don't really understand why he had to kill them. Because there can be only one. Yeah, but why? Absolutely. Because they, because they <laughs> the got prize. Tolkien. The prize. <laughs> What's what, he get? What prize? Well, he gets a load of, he gets a load of voices in his head and a load of weird hand drawn ghosts that fly around him while he's having an orgasm in a back alley. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> So, you know, you know, some of you won't have seen this film, so we won't completely spoil it, but you won't get we? you get the drift. I mean, you, you get the drift. Um Miles, 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 I'm 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 picking up. Not a fan. I don't know. 
I don't know. <laughs> I am, definitely. I mean, there's one scene here, and, and we'll talk about best scenes maybe. I think mm. it's, a good, it's a good opportunity. Mm. For me, the most unusual scene in this whole movie, and we did talk a little bit about the soundtrack. The soundtrack was, uh, well, the, the score was composed by Michael Kamen, of course, who did yeah. uh, Lethal Weapon and yeah. Symphony and Metallica, the SNM album with Metallica, mm. where he he yeah, conducted a load of their their original kind of heavy metal hits into yeah. more well, classical compositions. Mm-hmm. The late great, um, but also of course there was a, a accompanying uh, kind of score, rock score, by the rock band Queen. Absolutely, um, one of the greatest bands ever to exist. Thank right. you, Phil. Um, so for me, there was a, a really interesting scene. There was a there was a, a musical moment. In this movie, did you catch that scene? <laughs> Many musical moments, yeah. yeah. What, what, yeah. Part, what part could I possibly be talking about? Was it about? the car? It was the, the car chicken, scene, the chicken so, scene. So, so there's a scene where the Kurgan snatches, um, uh, snatches uh, Connor Hello. McLeod's girlfriend, uh, and uh, steals steals her in his car, and drives off through the city, playing chicken with other cars, driving up on the sidewalk, knocking people over. And as he's doing that. He starts singing in a really bizarre baritone because he's he's got a slit throat. Let's face it, and he's kind of singing, you know, difficult difficulty singing, singing uh, the classic uh, Frank Sinatra's "New York, New York," New which York. which then yeah, <laughs> New York, New York. As he drives around, and we just have the the girlfriend just screaming like yeah. screaming so loudly. It was well, uh, I was going to mention that like I can't. Oh. So we go on, carry on. I'll bring that up in a minute. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so he then crosses the the, the bridge. Uh, I believe it's the uh, the, the uh, Manhattan Bridge. And as he's driving over the Manhattan Bridge into Brooklyn, singing "New York, New York," mm. Queen's score then comes in, and we then have Freddie Mercury mm. <laughs> singing along with him. It's brilliant. New York, New York. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it is so unusual and unexpected I've, 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 I've got to segue there and say that actually freddie really didn't want to do that apparently to uh the directory he really did not want to do a new new york cover um well i'm glad he bloody did yeah <laughs> i mean for me i i like that i like that because it was at that point where i was like I'm not crazy. This film is crazy. It's not me that's crazy. The film's crazy. Yeah. So that's good. I, I'm now starting to differentiate between yeah. this movie and my actual life. And now yeah. I realize that I'm not crazy. But so that I for me was The point unusual. I want to bring up, and because you said it there, and one observation that I wrote down specifically about this and about other scenes in this film, and because you said about like the audio being overdubbed so after, weird. which it definitely is in, in a lot of places, the screaming of like... Uh, Connor McLeod's um, he- uh, what's her name Heather Heather the- in in, in, Heather. Scotland. in Scotland Scotty Heather in, in Scotland when when there's the castle fight scene between Ramirez and Kirby oh, yeah. she is screaming like at the top of her lungs and it is uh, it was upsetting to my ears yeah. like I could it was so loud yeah. it was unbelievable yeah, same. exactly the same in, in the, the car, car chicken chase across yeah. the bridge and exactly the same in the climax of the film at the silver cup sign yeah like. All of the screaming in this was so unbelievably badly mixed yeah, and loud agreed. that it hurt oh, my ears. Oh, the, the footsteps at the beginning when <laughs> very loud when footsteps when when, when he gets <laughs> when he, <laughs> I picked that up when, as well. Actually, when Conor McLeod gets arrested outside of um, the uh, uh, um, Madison Square That's Garden great, yeah. parking lot, like the car park, the yeah. police, uh, he's like, hey you, get over here, hey yeah, all these voices, go on, go over here, get in the car. And as he gets dragged over the car, their footsteps are louder than the dialogue. Yeah. The Foley <laughs> artists were having a field day on this, weren't they? They were wasting. They're just like, let's just crank up the gain. Yeah, just stamp on that. Stamp on the floor. Yeah. Scrape your foot of, across that tarmac. Put white trainers and go and stamp on that. <laughs> Some of that bag of chips over, that bag of crisps. Their footsteps, I picked up. Again, that's another observation I made. The footsteps in this are insanely loud. It's insanely loud. In every, I was like, "Why are the footsteps so and loud?" Sword noises, sword swishing noises. Yeah. right, Insanely right, right. Loud. Can can I just say, as someone, yo, know, someone wearing blue jeans and white trainers, you pair of bastards. <laughs> We're just destroying exactly. Sean's. This is this is my childhood. You're destroying him. Hey, Sean, I loved it. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, mm. I actually liked it. <laughs> can I? I want to know. I want to know. 
favorite scene. So fa- favorite scene. So Sean, 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 get us started off on your favorite scene. I want to, I want to know Everything. what it is about this movie that you love and what scene in particular Everything. is your favorite. Everything. Everything that happens from, <laughs> from the points, from, from the dawn of time it came to the end credits. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, right, fine. I'll take over there. <laughs> Phil, me, you're on deck. Best scene, and I've got two. I'm going to do two. All right, <laughs> quick one. The church scene. Mm, where Kirk brilliant. Goes into Let's the church. Loved it. Connor McLeod's gone in there to light uh, a candle for his wife <laughs> that died yeah. a few hundred years ago, and she told him as a dying wish that she that he would light a candle on her birthday every year, and he obviously does. And he's gone in the church. Does that. Kurgan walks in. What does he do? Walks over. Uh, walks over to the candles. <laughs> smashes them out with his hands. Just goes, like duh, laughing. Duh, <laughs> duh, duh, duh. Uh, smashes out all the candles. Right. In this scene, Kurgan is the biggest prick I've ever seen. Really? Like, he's so annoying. Like, But it's brilliant. Was it, That's was it the brilliant. moment he licked the priest's hand? He licked the priest? <laughs> he licked the priest. Can, 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 I just, uh, can I just say that uh, apparently... Clancy Brown actually, after that scene, went round and apologised to the priest he and, the nurse, to. and the nurses, apologising to, to say that he the, uh, the if this was if this was sacrilegious. Yeah, in the awkwardness that yeah. comes across in that scene <laughs> is like very is there. awkward. It's just yeah. yeah. And then the other scene, because I said I had two, and it's because it's got. <laughs> Uh, it's the scene in the alleyway where where Kurgan's fighting another one of the immortals that you see for like thirty seconds in the rest of the film. Who's actually I can't remember his British actor. I can't remember his name, but I know he played Captain Panica in the episode one Star Wars. Uh, that's all I recognise him from, and he's in like Holby City or something. <laughs> Everyone um, is. I can't remember. I can't remember his name, but yeah, he fights that guy, and then this crazy uh, former marine like sees the sword fight <laughs> happening. <laughs> Right. That, that scene it, love it. is so fucking ra- No, it doesn't just yeah. sit there. Crazy Marine doesn't just sit. Crazy Marine's driving around in a fucking. He's looking, looking a, for this shit. Yeah. In, trans Am. In, in a Trans Am. Yeah. yeah. Firebird. Yeah. It, with, yeah. With a with a Mac 10 and Uzi 9mm <laughs> in, a, in a gym bag on the passenger seat. Yeah. Yeah. Just, we don't He's think we just, this it. is not a main character. This might, you might, what I'm saying, you might see, this just, no, this just happens t- in about 45 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes into the film. We just see this oh, random least, guy yeah. driving around New York. His name's Kirk Matunas in the, uh, in the, it's this character played by. No, you know who he is? By... It's Truman's dad from the Truman Show. Is he? It explains yeah. a lot. Well, do you know who I recognized him as straight away? His name's Christopher Malcolm, the yep. actor. The person I recognized him in straight away, and only probably people that appreciate classic British comedy television from the 80s and 90s, I recognized him as the axe murderer in the Only Fools and Horses episode, Friday the 14th. <laughs> God. Do you remember that episode where they go into oh. this this weird hut and they see this guy and he's like an axe murderer? Phil, and uh, Phil, you, it's a brilliant episode. You have watched way too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched way too much Only Falls and Horses. He was also in the Empire Strikes Back as a rebel pilot. My will, well. la belle. My will. My will. <laughs> so that was those were your two favourite scenes. You would say, not, not yeah, that crazy then. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. So, so I, I mean, th- th- I think we've got to talk about, you know, the late great Sean Connery. That I, I would say that this film goes up about ten notches in terms of quality when Connery turns up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. easily doesn't it? I mean, he, he. How does he arrive? Tell us about how he arrives, Sean. I thought. I, th- I mean, I think that that was known from day one. I mean, mm. the guys who, yeah, the producers. Uh, and company knew this that's why they wanted this guy um yeah but from so that... i guess everyone else was unknown at this point in this movie there was no, there was no ma- other big name attached to it chris chris lambert what, what he, i mean lambert, lambert greystoke i mean i mean which was a lot of the reason he was cast i mean russell mulcahy the director himself has said that the fact that when he saw you know that those eyes shall we say um, but I mean, <laughs> I, and kind, I'm kind of with that. Those 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 eyes kind of do date back four hundred years, don't they? Um, um, sure. If you put a you know braids in his hair and give him long hair, <laughs> a shitty Scottish accent, then maybe. 
like the worst Scottish accent you've ever heard. Yeah. In life. Well, we it's a had French a Scottish Scott accent, doing, isn't it? Doing a, an Egyptian, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Again, part part of the whole Highlander roller coaster. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you must leave her, brother. I was yeah. born two thousand four hundred thirty-seven years ago. In that time, I've had three wives. The last was Shakiko, a Japanese princess. When Shakiko died, I was shattered. I would shave you that pain. Please, let Heather go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, you're, you're Spanish, and it's the year 15-whatever, and somehow you've been in Japan. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of feel my childhood being pissed over here. Um <laughs> I just, I'm pissing over it with, with massive fondness. With, with, with absolute, yeah, it, it it requires it requires it. Favorite line, favorite line from this movie. I've got, I've got a couple. So I mentioned the one earlier one about you look like a woman, you stupid <laughs> as a as an insult. I mean that's hard to beat, isn't it? But uh, in that same scene, I think it's the same scene. He says uh, Ramirez, Sean Connery says you. You have the manners of a goat, yep. and you smell like a dung heap. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Yeah. His insults only got better, didn't they, until The Rock? Let's oh, yeah. yeah. He just, when he got to The Rock, he didn't bother calling people a dung heap. He, he just called them a piece of shit. Piece of shit. <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. Oh, dung heap, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then later in the film, Conor McLeod says uh, to Brenda, who's his love interest yeah. in the film, uh, he says, I've been alive for four and a half centuries. I cannot die. And she says, everyone has got their problems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for wow. me, for me, this film and this film for me, as you can tell, I wasn't as down on it and as positive as, as you guys. Yeah. Um, but there is one saving grace. And I think that this film has possibly the best final line hmm. and don't spoil it of any movie in the history of movies yeah and that is when conor mcleod um retires to the uh <laughs> the heathery scottish highlands and More we see him sitting there yeah. with his with his young wee lady and we get the uh we get the obi-wan um <laughs> use the force from uh, from Sean Connery himself, who now is apparently in, intertwined into his soul or something, so he sees everything. No, uh, Connor, you're doing it wrong. Use your hips more. Use your, <laughs> use more of your hips. Like, apparently, he's just seeing and hearing everything. Um, but he gives him some advice. This is the last scene in the film, and it's a, it's a voiceover from Sean Connery. Patience, Highlander. You have done well, but it will take time. There are generations being born and dying. You're at one with all living things. Each man's thoughts and dreams are yours to know. You have power beyond imagination. Use it well, my friend. Don't lose your head. <laughs> <laughs> because it's all about not losing yeah. your head. Which at some level is kind of genius. Yeah. I think that was ge- Don't lose your head. It's a brilliant, yeah. brilliant one line. And it's right brilliant. at the end of the film. I absolutely love that. Um, so well, yeah, I, you know, I, for yeah. me, um, an, an interesting movie, definitely of its time. I, I would enjoy it. I think after copious amounts of alcohol, <laughs> probably not, you know, like yeah. till eight o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that was it for me. Phil thoughts, closing thoughts. Yeah. Uh, didn't realize I hadn't seen it all the way through. Thought it was ridiculous, but loved it at the same time. Uh, and I sort of want to watch the second one. <laughs> no, <Soon>. no. <laughs> Is it that bad? Oh, fuck. No, let's not get started on that. Don't, no, don't, get, started. don't get started. So, Sean, thanks for joining us on the Movie Mouth podcast this week. Phil, do you have any last words? Uh, no. <laughs> thanks, Sean, though. <laughs> Cheers, Sean. Appreciate it. And join us on the next Movie Mouth podcast for a slice of movie and TV related podcast fun. But before then, please do follow us on our Facebook and Instagram accounts at at Movie Mouth Podcast and hit subscribe or give us a nice five star review on your podcast player of choice. And please subscribe and download there so that we know you're out there and you're listening. There's just one last thing to say, isn't there? Is there?
There can be only one. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Bye then. Bye. Yeah, I guess.